one often hears stories of prominent spiritual teachers who have been knocked off their pedestal, um, sometimes due to um, pretty flagrant abuses. I think it is important to realize uh, that um, there are also um, plenty of, of spiritual teachers uh, who um, do not participate in uh, abuses, flagrant or otherwise. Also, it's important to realize that um, even though um, there may be um, some flaws uh, in uh, a teacher, uh, that relative to who that person would have been otherwise, uh, they've made uh, stunning uh, uh, transformation of themselves. In other words, it's important to keep the big picture in mind. It's, uh, there's a Japanese proverb, hyakunichi no seppo he shitotsu. It means you can give uh, perfect sermons for a hundred days, but all you have to do is fart once, and that's what everyone will remember. So uh, it's important to, I think, keep the big picture in mind. Also remember that most people, in fact, the great majority of people that practice the, these techniques, are not teachers. Um, you never hear of them. Um, and the great majority of them have made uh, stunning and radical overall improvements in their lives, although there are still areas uh, of uh, uneven growth. I think we shouldn't have unrealistic expectations about teachers. Well, then how is it that um, these teachers have this uneven growth? Uh, that they're so strong in certain areas, but in a sense stunted in other areas. I think that the main cause of this is some combination of um, unwillingness or inability to get feedback from other people on their behavior. So what do I mean by unwillingness or um, inability? Well. Sometimes things are set up for a teacher in a way that um, they actually can't get feedback from people because they're put on a, a pedestal and students automatically assume that if they see some flaw in the teacher, that it must be a flaw in the student. The tradition sets things up that way. So there, there aren't actually feedback loops to the teacher. Who's the teacher going to get feedback from? Well, another more senior teacher, if they're willing to put themselves under and keep themselves under a more senior teacher, even when they themselves are relatively senior, if they're willing to do that, then some feedback structure will be in place. But many people are not willing to do that. After 30 or 40 years of practice, they want to be completely independent. So then who's going to give them feedback? Well, the, their world is primarily the world of their students. So um, they uh, would have to get feedback from their students, but their students may have a mindset that, um, uh, that the teacher is better than they really are and therefore be afraid or unwilling to give them feedback. Well, then who will give them feedback? Well. Maybe their family will give them feedback. But if their family is not their student or not a meditator, uh, it's easy for teachers to uh, dismiss the feedback of people that haven't had a lot of meditative experience. So that's the unwillingness to take feedback. So some combination of um, inability to get feedback and unwillingness to take feedback um, if you maintain that consistently, you do run the danger of having blind spots in your development. So I think it's of the utmost importance that a person from the get-go decide that they will listen to feedback from everyone, whether that person is an adult or a child, whether they're an advanced meditative practitioner or are clueless with regards to um, the, the uh, spiritual path.
a willingness and an ability, meaning that the structures are in place, the channels are in place, uh, and you're willing to use those channels, uh, that people will approach you on your stuff. Then you take a consensus. See, one of the problems for teachers is that <laughs> an awful lot of the time when students do uh, uh, call you on your stuff, actually it is their stuff. <laughs> it's the student's stuff, not yours. And that gets to be, that consumes time and energy. And maybe even 80, 90 percent of the time, it's really them, it's not the teacher. But that 20 percent or 10 percent of the time that it is the teacher and that there's something for them to listen to, oh, they have to be willing to invest that 80 or 90 percent um, of time, which is a lot of time, okay? Uh, in general, teachers, if they're good at teaching, they're overworked. They don't have any play, any uh, extra time and energy. They're just, they're just going 24-7 flat out, uh, at least most of the ones that I know that are good at what they do. It's a lot to listen consistently to what the students have to say about you as a person when a lot of that data is not of any use to you. But I think it's uh, essential that you be willing to invest that even though it's, you know, it's a bear. Because there will be patterns, uh, a consensus will emerge with time about your blind spots. And that will help uh, assure a more even growth pattern. And in fact, my general approach to ethics is uh, a little different, maybe radically different, from most people's approach to ethics. I suspect that most people's approach to ethics is that there are certain principles that should be followed or maybe certain rules that should be followed, or maybe in the really extreme case, an, an elaborate um, uh, legalistic uh, ethical system. But that's not my approach at all. I actually, I say that the four basic precepts of Buddhism about not taking life, not taking what's not given, not speaking falsehoods, and not uh, uh, doing things in the sexual domain that would be harmful to people, I say those are some basic guidelines. I certainly have that much in terms of axioms. But beyond that, I think that the, um, the, the main way that one uh, cultivates ethics is an openness, a general openness, to feedback from all other human beings with regards to how you're carrying yourself in the world.